Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. For last episode, a great deduction took place as we unraveled a mystery within Madame Tuspel's Museum of Waxworks, learning via correction that a theft of a waxwork had occurred with a ransom note left behind, and that there was a man on the ground that was knocked out by the owner after having meddled with a separate exhibit, with our final thing of note being the sleeping policeman on the scene, as we wondered why this was all relevant to our case. This correction did lead to us learning the missing waxworks identity, the Professor, who 10 years ago killed many high-profile personages, including Barok Van Zeek's older brother. We now head to trial to face as we defend his friend. I can't believe it's been six months since I was last allowed to work in court. And now here I am, back at the old Bailey. Ah, m m Mr. Nadhodo! Good morning, Professor Hairbrain. I... I don't understand! It doesn't make any sense! The atmospheric pressure in here is off the charts! I've never felt anything like it! It is... it's crushing me! I feel that every time I'm here... That... gravity... Well, this is Britain's highest court. But are you telling me it's fitted with some kind of device that can actually control air pressure? I think it's probably all in the mind. Ah, yes, well... You won't let me down, will you? Mr. Nadahodo? I'm counting on you in today's trial to save my life! To save the secret of my super high voltage instantaneous kinesis machine from being made public! Yes, I understand. I know what I have to do. I have to establish that the explosion two days ago was nothing more than an unfortunate accident. Well, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about, really. Justice will prevail. My commiserations, Mr. Nanohono. You appear to have been lumbered with a most tiresome case here. Mail? No, Sholmes! Mr. Sholmes, I didn't expect to see you here. That was very mean, Bruno, leaving me all alone at home with Hurley. To me at least an hour to wake him. Ah! Oh! Ah! Is it? Are you? Here, Lock Sholmes! Indeed, sir, I am he. Herlock Sholmes! Oh, I've heard all about your exploits, even whilst living in Germany. Ah, yes. Rance magazine is on sale in Germany, too. This month's installment was sublime. Your deduction in The Adventure of Silver Blaze was wonderful. Ah, yes. A memorable case, indeed. It concerned a snake, I seem to recall. No, that was the speckled band. Well, uh, thank you for coming. I do appreciate your support. I'm sorry to disappoint you, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid I can't stay. Oh? I have urgent business at Madame Tuspel's. You mean your waxwork job? No, no, the waxwork abduction, of course. Madame has engaged my services. Ah, so you're trying to get to the bottom of that ransom note, are you? The week's wages depend on it, as does the safe return of the waxwork, naturally. As such, I intend to give it my undivided attention. Oh, well, never mind then. I understand. Of course, with my skills of observation and reasoning, resolving the matter will be as easy as proverbial pie. I shall return forthwith. For until I solve the case, I shall have no money to afford a pie of any description. Oh, then you must absolutely give it your full attention, Hurley. Quite, Iris, quite. But life is riddled with irony, you know. Whenever I give something my full attention, I have a quite insatiable desire for a pie. One of the universe's intractable mysteries, you might say. Oh yes, quite definitely, absolutely, I totally understand. It is someone a little starstruck. I wish you the very best of luck, Professor Hairbrain. Oh, uh, oh, oh, why thank you. Before I depart, Mr. Narohodo, a word in your ear, if you please. What's this about? As you have remarkably little grounding in science, I feel I ought to inform you. As compelling as this super high voltage instantaneous kinesis hypothesis may be, a practical implementation such as was attempted by the Professor of the Great Exhibition is quite impossible. But the Professor said the demonstration was a success. Yes, it would appear that he fervently believes it was. I've read Professor Bunny Brain's paper about it too, Runo, and I have to say, I'm sure it can't be done. It could barely be done theoretically, let alone practically. 
So he's completely barking up the wrong tree. But how could an experiment that had no possibility of succeeding in fact succeed? That's contradictory. And it's that contradiction that will be at the heart of the trial, I've no doubt. What's that supposed to mean? Now, I must hurry along. I wish you the best of luck, my dear fellow. See you later, Hurley. Well, it looks like you're on your own today, Runo. But chin up, you can do it. Oh, what about you, Iris? Ah, no, I'm afraid I can't help. I have something I need to do. I see. <laughs> it's gonna be a big surprise for you. When you find out what it is. Ah, that sounds ominous. Counsel for the defense and the defendant. Court is about to be in session. Make your way into the courtroom at once. We're on our way. An experiment that the laws of science say can't possibly succeed. And a scientist who's convinced that it did. That's the riddle you have to unlock here, Ryanosuke. That's the key to this case. So on the 23rd of October, our trial begins. And it's not Sosuke Natsume this time. <laughs> In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. We are sitting today for the public trial of Professor Albert Hairbrain. I now call upon the counsels for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is... The defense is ready, my lord. I'm six months out of practice, and what's more? I'm without Suzada-san today. Ugh. Is it just my imagination, or does the air in here feel even more oppressive than usual? So, I must say I recollect the victim of this case all too well, Mr. Ori Asman. Mr. Asman was well known as a financier, though that was merely a front for his diverse criminal activities. It was only a month ago that the man appeared in court prosecuted by you, Lord Van Zeex. But the jury unanimously found him not guilty. Because every member of the jury had been bribed by the sound of it. These powerful London criminals are prepared to go to extreme lengths to keep their freedom. But two days ago, on 21st of October, Mr. Adman met his end. The work of the Reaper, was it? If that is how your lordship would describe divine retribution. But the fact remains that Mr. Asman's death was a direct result of the actions of the accused, Professor Hairbrain. Very well then. And now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected at random to represent the will of the people. Are the six of you ready to fulfill your societal duty? I'm most gratified to have been selected to carry out this important civic duty, my lord. To have a man's fate in the palm of one's hand. Oh gosh, oh golly, it sends shivers down my spine. Science experiments, magic conjuring tricks, courtroom trials, all are nothing more than performances. Any spurious scholar that defiles the reputation of science deserves to hang. Um, we have to listen to what's on both sides, the fence, and, um, then settle on one. That's it, isn't it? How can you be a dirt? Sure, <laughs> like, ridiculous, what? Wasn't like this in my day. Wasn't like this at all. That's... That's... The police killer Otomo lookalike. Again. And he's as exhausted as ever, it seems. It's a very different jury, though. Now that I'm sure you are all aware that the incident we are here to judge today tragically took place at the Great Exhibition shortly after its opening. Though the death toll could have been far worse, with the exception of the victim, no one was killed. Nevertheless, the dream of the signs being exhibited rapidly turned into a nightmare for the spectators. A tragic turn of events, and as such, the eyes of all London, no, of the whole world, will be on this trial. 
It is our duty to reach a swift and just conclusion, I feel. So, your opening statement, please, Lord Van Zeeks. At the heart of this incident is technology never before demonstrated anywhere in the world. One of science's latest developments, I take it. The government is keen to capitalize on the great exhibition to improve Britain's technological advantage. The technology being demonstrated by the accused was described as super high voltage instantaneous kinesis. Good lord! It's designed to disassemble human subjects using extremely high voltage electricity and beam them instantly to another location where they are subsequently reassembled. Is... is such a thing even within the realms of possibility? Well, I don't believe it, that's for sure. Disassembling people with electricity? My goodness, how shocking! Ah, the whole idea is absurd! The hypothesis would never stand up to scrutiny. Sir, I believe you are a fellow of the Royal Society, are you not? An expert in your field? I am, and my word on the matter can be considered final. Instantaneous kinesis is poppycock! So this expert and Mr. Sholmes are in agreement. It's impossible. What is the prosecution's view on the matter? The prosecution would assert... ...that the accused instantaneous kinesis demonstration was a success. What? What rot? Order! Order! The professor's hypothesis is currently under investigation by the British government. If it is deemed to have merit, a substantial research grant will be made available. The accused made use of the invention built on his new hypothesis to take Mr. Asman's life, in order to be the sole benefactor of the grant. But, but, this disastrous demonstration was no accident. It was carefully designed from the outset to end the life of the victim. Thank you, Lord Antiques. The prosecution stance is clear. But you will now bring forth witnesses to substantiate your claims. Gladly, my lord. Bailiff. Show the first witnesses to the stand. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court. Yes, sir. Tobias Gregson, Detective Inspector of Scotland Yard's Homicide Division. I was on duty at the demonstration on the day in question and in charge of the following investigation. Albert Hairbrain, this is a scientist. You were born in England, but have been carrying out research in Germany in recent years, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. After graduating from university here in Britain, I went to work in Germany and made an amazing discovery. Which is what brought me back. I had to demonstrate my incredible hypothesis at the Great Exhibition. What you demonstrate was incredible, all right? An incredible explosion. But the science! The science was a success! The instantaneous kinesis worked! Uh, everyone saw it! They must have done! Yes, there was the terrible accident, but... The demonstration of my hypothesis was a success! Well, that much is undeniable, as shown in this photograph taken by the forensic investigation team. This was taken inside the Crystal Tower, I take it. The centerpiece of the exhibition, no less. That's right, my lord. Seems the victim ran straight into it. I see. Very well, submit the photograph as evidence. The photograph of the victim has been entered into the court record. As the court said, the victim of the incident was Mr. Odi Asman. There have been a number of allegations made against the man, but putting them aside for the time being, he was the man who financed the research for the experiment and the demonstration itself. I see. So to summarize the situation, a defendant is accused of taking the life of the man who funded his work. Would that be correct? Exactly. But couldn't it be that the explosion was caused by some malfunction in the apparatus used for the demonstration? 
That's right. That must be it. My splendid machine. My poor splendid machine. You saw it yesterday, didn't you? Can't even examine the wreckage thanks to the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. What? The wreckage? The wreckage? And that being the case, how can the facts be established? How can it possibly be determined whether this was an accident or a deliberate and malicious act? Extremely simply, my lord. I beg your pardon? Isn't that right, witness? What? Sorry, me? No, your neighbor. Yes, sir. It was murder, plain and simple. Anyone could state that with complete certainty. What? How could he possibly think that? Thank you, Inspector. I think we'd better proceed to formal testimony. You will explain to the court on what ground you claim this experiment would be an affront for murder. Affront for murder. The corpse that went crashing through the crystal tower had a broken neck. I- I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all. That was all my mistake. But the post-mortem examination revealed another injury, a fatal wound. There was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. So the victim was killed before he went anywhere, and this fella's the only one who could have done it. An extraordinary business. In addition to suffering a broken neck, the victim was stabbed in the heart. Information I would really like to have heard from someone other than the judge? Coroner says death would have been all but instant from a wound like that. You could say, in fact, that the victim was killed twice by the accused. No, 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 and no. That couldn't be further from the truth. I have here the experiment plan document that was submitted to the security team. The victim stood himself inside something called the birdcage, ready to be beamed instantly. To the second level of the crystal tower, about 25 yards away. And the experiment did not go according to plan, however. As the machine was put into operation, there was a large explosion. The blast caused the beam transmitter to point higher than intended. Accordingly, the kinesis resulted in the birdcage materializing midair. From where it subsequently fell, crashing through the glass of the crystal tower's large round window. My word! One assumes the victim's neck was broken upon impact with the tower then. I'm- I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen! But she was just too powerful! But honestly, really, I swear, it was just an accident, a terrible accident! Unfortunately, that excuse can't save you. No, not considering the sharp murder weapon that pierced the victim's heart. M -m -m murder weapon? What are you saying? This is the autopsy report submitted by the coroner. The prosecution would like it entered into the court record. Your request is granted, counsel. We have an autopsy report. Probably should check that out. I was there in person, you know. I saw the whole ludicrous performance. And the only other person on the stage with Mr. Asman was that disgraceful excuse for a scientist. Then really, by all accounts, it must have been him. Hmm. Hard to think otherwise, really. Very well. Counsel for the defense, proceed with the cross-examination, please. Oh, yes, my lord. I need to focus here. It's been a while. And so, a front for murder. That's what it was, was it? Before we start that... Let's just have a quick look around. Amazing how his glasses somehow stayed on throughout all this. <laughs> okay, then. <gasps> Your topsy report. Odie Asman, male, age 47, nationality British. Coroner was Courtney Sif. Does that matter? Hmm. 
Time of death, 21st of October, around 2.20 p.m. Not a happy birthday to him. Cause of death, hemorrhage of a wound to the chest that pierced the heart, inflicted by a sharp implement, so it was definitely that that killed him. Additional observations are broken vertebrae, most likely resulting from impact after a sudden fall from considerable height. Really from height, though. Interesting. The corpse that went crashing through the crystal tower had a broken neck. Hold it! Are you suggesting that's because he fell from a considerable height? Exactly. Which highlights something else about this whole rum business. What's that? The fact that the instantaneous kinesis itself was a success. Ah! After the explosion, the cage with the fella inside suddenly appeared out of nowhere midair. And so although the experiment ended in disaster, the so-called instantaneous kinesis did actually occur. Remind us, Professor, what was the cause of the fatal disaster? I, I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all. That was my mistake! Hold it! So the angle of projection is critical, is it? And you calculated it yourself, personally? Absolutely! The calculation is far too complicated for anyone but me to carry out. Only you got it wrong, didn't you? Yes, that's right. That's the point. The calculation is so complicated, even I can make a mistake. Do people fall for that brazen confidence? I should try it. I I took into account the subject's height and weight, the wind direction, the ambient temperature. I considered every possible variable, so I just don't understand how this could have happened. Obviously, then, you had to include the weight of the clothes Mr. Asman was wearing at the time, I suppose. Ah! Crackling comets! The answer should have been free! So much for safety first. The free must be for safety third. But the post mortem examination revealed another injury a fatal wound. Hold it! Another fatal injury, you say? That doesn't make any sense. I didn't think I'd have to spell this out, but here we go. Just because there were two fatal wounds doesn't mean I'm saying the victim had two lives to lose, does it? Too right. Obviously, at first, we thought the bloke could dodge due to his spine snapping in half as well. But you're saying that's not the case. You'll get your answer once I've finished my fish and chips if you don't keep burning every few seconds. But we all know that's a bottomless bag. The victim plummeted 30 feet into a glass tower. It would be reasonable to assume that as the cause of death. Right, that's what we all thought. But it was a red errand, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. That was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. Hold it! The defense knew nothing of this crucial information. But the prosecution received this report from the forensic investigation team only this morning. That was the first we knew of it as well. I can only apologize for the impossibility of informing the defense. Sarcastic and insincere. Thanks. So, what was the nature of this sharp object? Among the accused tools that were in use of the demonstration, one is of particular interest. This. Ah, uh, yes, that would appear to be some kind of screwdriver, wouldn't it, Council? Ha 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 ha! There he is! My trusty little companion! Andrew! Andrew, of course. Ah, do you know each other already? He's one of my dear friends, like all my tools. I've named them all you know. We're one big happy family. Andrew is my flathead screwdriver, of course. His brother, Michael, is a crosshead. Well, it would appear that your beloved Andrew has a red stain on his shank. Ah, that... that isn't... It's blood, beyond all reasonable doubt. No! And that's not all. A long, sharp shape of this Andrew fellow is completely consistent with the victim's wound. What? What? Order! Order! The court will enter this friend of the defendant as evidence. A screwdriver has been entered into the court record. So one of Professor Hairbrain's tools is the murder weapon. Great. 
The victim was killed before he went anywhere. And this fella's the only one who could have done it. Hold it! What grounds do you have for saying that? Ah, do you really need to ask? There were only two people on that public experimentation stage in front of the whole crowd. The victim, Mr. Odi Asman, and the accused, Professor Hairbrain. And we know for certain that before the experiment, the victim was alive. That's right, I saw him in my own eyes. Furthermore, following the explosion and kinesis, nobody went anywhere near the body. In other words, only someone else on stage with the victim could possibly have done it. Hello? Excuse me! Professor Hairbrain, do you have some information that may be relevant here? Professor! Ah, sorry, sorry! I was just calculating the optimum coefficient of electrolysis to separate molecules in the human body. And the witness stand is the best place for that? It seemed as though you might have something to say about Inspector Gregson's last remark. Ah! <laughs> yeah, yes, that's, that's right, that's course! He just said that nobody else could have done it, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. Who else could have stabbed the victim, eh? I don't know, but... There's no way that I could possibly have stabbed Mr. Asman as you say. Eh? Explain, please, Professor. Of course, this cold-hearted policeman may not be aware, I suppose. But humans are warm-blooded mammals with blood running continuously through their veins. I had heard. Then surely you see. If I plunged something the size of Andrew into the man's chest, the whole stage would have been a bloodbath. No, a blood swimming pool. Oh. But thousands of Londoners were watching me at the time. And yet not one of them claims to have seen a swimming pool of blood. Well, no. I suppose not. You see? Not one. Hmm. True, I didn't see anything like that. Well done, Professor. That was a great counter-argument. Shouldn't I be doing that? Order! Order! Pray forgive the discourtesy if I savor a drop from my hallowed chalice to accompany my old friend's adducing. Here's to you, Albert. Oh, you're too kind, Baroque, but I'm really not a patch on you. No, you're not. No? You've neglected to mention one crucial possibility. I have. A particularly... a particular situation in which very little bleeding would result from a stab wound. Ah, of course! Inspector, enlighten the court, please. Yes, sir! Where are they going with this? Very well. You will amend your formal testimony now, Inspector Gregson. Whoever the victim was stabbed with must have been left in his body while it was beamed through the air. Okay. Hold it! Why would you think that, Inspector? When it was literally on the scene? If any wound, it's only when you pull the weapon out that profuse bleeding occurs. Whilst it's still lodged in the body, it acts as a stopper source, for want of a better word. I... I see. You don't need a medical degree to be aware of this fact. It's common knowledge for any investigator. Ugh. Why is that a son when you need her? If you ask me, this bloke masked what he was doing from view of his body before stabbing Asman in the chest. Then he beamed the victim off the stage with his fancy device, the screwdriver still where he planted it. I- I would never do such a thing, not with my precious tools! I would never use them for such dirty work! I only use tools for their intended purpose! That's common knowledge for any scientist! The fact remains, a lack of blood at the scene can easily be explained, as the prosecution has demonstrated. I think I'm presenting the screwdriver to that statement then, by the look of it. So that's all the testimony I have to work with. I know I did the victim had been stabbed. That changes everything. Did Van Six keep that to himself until now on purpose to gain the advantage? Oh well, I suppose all I can do is press these witnesses for as much new information as possible. I think we know what to do. 
but our time in this episode is running out. So this usually gives me a good chance to not present at this point in time, but be go over evidence because we only just got that. We've checked out these, I know. We've checked out this. We've checked out this. We've read that. So I guess now that I can check this out, I should probably do that. This is blood. Mr. Asman's, no doubt. This is the problem with looking at murder weapons. Nothing else? I've seen this unusually shaped handle before. It's the same screwdriver that was lodged in the grill on the floor of the kinesis machine. Which could be important information, so I should definitely make a note of it. Oh. <laughs> Luckily, I've done this by the look of it. A metal screwdriver that was found poking through the grill on the base of what appear remains of the kinesis machine has a very distinctive handle. It's always good to make sure to check and update our evidence, and we got updating, because if I presented it before I updated it, I could have been in... Bad news, but now that we've got it listed as being in the kinesis machine and not have gone with him, I think we've got what we need to do. But we will do that next time on the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. And we start to break down this case and still wonder what the hell was the stuff in the Museum Waxworks was really about in the end of it. Let's find out more next time. I'll see you guys around. Bye bye.